Plato and Aristotle, and many after them, and even God himself at many places in sacred scripture have often indicated that human nature is in three separate levels. The vegetable level at the bottom, which is equivalent to one's body, which is what we have in common with plants. A sensate or animal le level in the middle, which is one's nervous and endocrine systems and is what we have in common with animals. And a rational level, which is divided into intellect and will, and is what we have in common with angels and with God. Plato was the first to chart these three levels in his book The Republic. He noted that there were what he called certain areas of man, rational, spirited, appetitive, and bodily or self-indulgent areas. Those who emphasized the rational part of their nature he termed philosopher kings. Guardians, which were police or military, were those who emphasized the spirited part of their nature. Bankers, merchants, and artisans emphasized the appetitive part of their nature. Commoners emphasized the bodily or self-indulgent part of their nature. Lastly, drones, slaves to their lusts and therefore slaves by nature, were so brutish as to be inhuman. A government ruled by philosopher kings emphasizing rationality would be termed aristocracy, or rule by the best, most virtuous people, from Greek aristo, meaning best. The aristocracy would eventually degrade into a timocracy, or rule based on those with honor, such as military heroes. This again would have degrade into an oligarchy, or rule by the few, rich, which eventually could degrade into a democracy, or rule by the many. In certain situations, the, even the democracy could degrade into a tyranny, which was when the people were enslaved to their own violent lusts and therefore outside forces controlling them. Aristotle also had a similar system with different terms, but Aristotle still used the term rational, and but he called the rest of human nature irrational. This irrational part he divided into the truly irrational and what he called the spirited or sensate. In his De Anima, Aristotle further divided human nature into intellect and will, and then the vegetative and the sensitive, appetitive and locomotive. Some basic principles. Spirit, the part of you which tends upward. The body, the part of you which tends downward. The soul, the principle of circulation that unites spirit and body and holds it together. Some people have defined soul as the life or the livingness in a being. Death, separation of spirit and body by destruction of the middle layer, the senses, or you might even say by removal of the soul. Five external senses, which are what we normally mean by senses, taste, touch, sight, hearing, and smell. But then there are also two internal senses, which most people don't think of, or at least they aren't mentioned in modern biology. But the ancient philosophers considered them a whole separate class of senses, and they are basically imagination and instinct. From a biological perspective, they would be the brain waves, but also the waves going, the electrical impulses going around the spinal cord and nerves, and also endocrine things. So here we have therefore divided the sensate level into internal senses, which remember are instinct and imagination, and external senses. Obviously the internal senses are spiritual, partially share in spiritualness, they're partially spiritual, and the, or we might even say they're oriented towards the spiritual, whereas the external senses are oriented downwards towards the material. Now the internal senses are oriented upwards towards the spiritual, in a certain sense, your imagination looks up into your realm of ideas. The eyeballs even rotate, rotate up when you close your eyes to imagine. Conversely, the external senses are downward oriented, focusing on the material world, usually for getting food and survival. Now a curious thing occurs when you consider the number of dimensions at each level. You, the body is three-dimensional. 
What about your external senses? Taste, touch, hearing, sight, and smell. Well, think about a screen or about the surface on which you feel things or the surface on which you see things, which would be the surface of your eye. What is that? Surfaces are two-dimensional. What about your internal senses, instinct, and imagination? Well, that's actually one-dimensional, and you can see it is in the dimension of time, which is basically just succession of before and after. Well, let's follow the pattern. Three-dimensional, two-dimensional, one-dimensional is just a line. What if, what, for, what if we took away that one dimension from a line? What would we be left with? A point, that's correct. And our rational level is basically the physical equivalent of a point, which obviously is meaningless. Nothing can be an infinitely small point. And so the ra what this is saying is that the rational level has no extension in this physical universe. In other words, it is from outside this universe. So if there is a real distinction between rationality and the internal senses that, of imagination and instinct that we share with animals, if there is a real distinction between those two, then rationality should, following the extrapolative extrapolation or pattern, be zero-dimensional. This is a not a proof, but a demonstration that the soul is fully spiritual and survives, de survives death. It is also strong evidence that there is a God, or at least other spirits out there. Before we said that the spirit tends upward and the flesh downward, while the soul was a principle of circulation. Now, this is for any creature, living creature, either for a plant, or an animal, or a human being. Obviously, a plant's soul would be sap, or water, circulating through the plant. An animal's soul would be blood, or various biological molecules, like um, electrons flowing through its nerves, or blood flowing through its veins. And for a human, a human would have those two, but then also have another quality circulating through it, which is consciousness, and intellect, and will, and rationality. I'll just call that rationality. So we are aware of these things. Alright, so there are different, different gradations of soul. This, of course, is very important for issues such as the state level of being of an unborn child. Intellect and will. Okay, now the next thing we need to learn is the difference between intellect and will. In fact, this is a very general principle that occurs throughout everything that exists. Intellect tends downward from the more general to the more specific. Will tends upward from the more less from the specific to the more general. In the there are also forms of intellect that animals participate in and use. Animal imagination and animal instinct. That's in the internal senses. In the external senses, there is even another kind. Animal sensation is a sensation is a form of intellect. And motor faculty, or using your muscles, is a form of will. Lastly, even plants participate in these. Growth is a form of intellect in a way, in as much as the plant keeps track of everything that it has in its body. And nutrition is a form of will, which is energy, basically. We see then that there is a transcendence of intellect and will through all levels of creatures. This is because intellect and will are higher even than creatures. Our two theological virtues of faith and love let us know that intellect and will have some significance in God himself. Christians would say that intellect corresponds to our life in God the Son, who is the Word, and will corresponds to life in God the Holy Spirit, who is the love and goodness in God. Okay, I believe that as a result of original sin, human nature got out of whack and that this middle sensate level layer here got flipped around, which is why 
you will see the effects of the fall later cause this middle sensate layer to get way out of control, really big, and often overrule the rationality above it. That should be ruling it. So, well, how does this work? Well, um, if my theory is right, and this is only a theory, but, it's, but I've thought through it a lot, imagination and senses are now primarily willful, where by nature they should be intellectual. Similarly with instinct and motor skills, they're primarily intellectual in that we don't really control our instinct, it just happens, and motor faculty often affects the outside physical world, thereby participating in intellect. But each of these are in the opposite environment. So like sensei, senses sense willful light, which is basically energy coming in, and they take that energy and pass it to the imagination, which processes it, and then by means of the imagination, the will, it, it, the imagination is able to see values in those imagine, imagined, imaginative images or phantasms, and so um, imagination now is our principal faculty of willing at least as long as we are in a fallen state and our sensate level is greater than our rational level. Okay, there are two terms that Thomas Aquinas and the scholastics and the ancients, even Aristotle, used. Intelligible species is the idea coming in, falling into your instinct, or the imagination imagining an idea inside its imagery. For instance, inside of an imagination of a race car, you have the concept um, race car or Thunderbird or something. Similarly, sensible species are the light or some other sense impulse coming into our senses or a, a impulse going out of our senses. So these are our connections from the sensei into the two realms or beyond them. Two trends noted from Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologica, which is obviously the best philosophy book in history besides the things that Aristotle that we still haven't figured out, are the appetitive areas, and then as a result of the fall, in my opinion, are now twisted into the intellectual column. And the, in, and the physical intellectual area is now twisted into the appetitive column. Motor faculty is over here in the intellectual, whereas sensation is over here. Okay, so this is the result. Intellect, another name for intellect is evolution or propagation of higher principles down into lower concrete results. And another term for will is striving or intention of lower beings for higher goals. Um, there are six concupiscible passions in the Summa Theologica, and it's a good way to divide up the passions of the sensate level. Now, I have hatred and love and happiness and sadness drawn outside the sensate level, but really they are just barely inside of it. The reason I drove it, drew it outside is because these passions are directly connected and therefore f one feels as if they're actually down in that lower level or up in that higher level. But um, as we experience it as an animal creature, they're actually um, slightly inside the sensate level. So um, hatred is primarily uh, feels like a rational impulse. You could call it rational. Okay, let's not call it sensate. Let's just call it actually rational, because you could have purely rational, non-expressed hatred, like hatred of a principle. Same with love. You could have love of a principle or love of an idea. Happiness um, is bodily well-being. That's the passion of the will down in the body. Sadness is bodily not well-being, just mere bare existence. That's the passion of the intellect down in the body. Notice that these two passions are reflected up into the opposite. Now, why is that? Well, because human beings have the ability to bend their rationality down into their physical world, just like that. 
conversely, they have the ability to lift, elevate their physical world yeah, up into the processing of their rationality. They can even ele elevate it up in other things, such as in sacraments, which elevate physical objects into spiritual val to have spiritual value. Okay, um, repulsion, of course, is the intellectual passion at the sensate level, and desire is the intellectual pa was the willful passion at the sensate level. So here, when everything is pointing up, folded upward, that's called the spiritual mindset. When everything is folded downward, that's called the physical mindset. The Bible also speaks of this, saying, be in the spirit, don't be in the flesh. Now that may honestly have a diff slightly different meaning, because there it may mean the Holy Spirit, but still there's a sense of that statement that refers to this here. Okay, besides the simple six simple concupiscible passions, there's four two-part irascible passions, and the irascible passions are what animals have to get around obstacles and maneuver tactically. Now, imagine that there is some evil coming at you, which is this black cross out up here, and this sun, or good symbol down here, is some other action that you would have to take to escape the oncoming evil. Fear is when the stark terror and foreboding of your apprehension at the oncoming evil is stronger than your initiative to move into action to escape or counteract it. Conversely, audacity is when your toughness in acting outweighs your instinctive foreboding of the danger of the situation. Now, as for the right column over here in Will, um, imagine that this sun here is some wonderful imagined goal that you would love to come about. And down low, the black cross out is the sight of the current depressing reality that is not conducive to that imagined goal. Hope is when your imagination and concentration on the goal is stronger than the sight of what you're actually seeing. Despair is when your vision of the overwhelming sight of what you're seeing is much stronger than your imagination of the goal. Of course, in these passions, too, there are also spiritual and physical mindsets. Passing through these levels are the two great processes of intellect and will. Intellect knows, will pursues. No matter what level of intellect and will it is, that is true. Intellect knows, will pursues. For purposes of morality, we are not concerned with intellect. Good and evil reside solely in the will, and there is our good and evil. So far, we're only considering will as love or valuing. One might even say attraction. All beings are attracted to the good to good things and repelled by evil things. However, in rational creatures up here, the attraction is strongest because they are conscious of those goods and evils. In animals, the attraction is less strong because they are only subconscious of those goods and evils. In plants and other bodies, the attraction is very weak because they are unconscious of the actual goods and evils. What is conscience? Conscience is typically defined as the conclusion of the syllogism judgment of moral reasoning. Namely, if you think to yourself, something X is evil, and this action that I'm doing in the physical reality is X, then what? Therefore, connect the X's, this action is evil. That conclusion is the judgment of the, the practical reason, the conclusion of the judgment of practical reason, and that is what your conscience is. It is a mental conclusion. So, humans have a conscience, animals have a subconscious, and plants do not have a conscience. Conscience is important for deciding how we act morally. Are we going to choose goods or evils? Of course, human beings are not perfect. Because they are often tired and weak and imprudent, they don't do all the good that they could do. 
Indeed, it would be unreasonable to, to expect a human to do all the good that they could do. Therefore, conscience never commands. It never says, thou shalt. Unless, of course, you've made a prior commitment or contract or vow to do that. Rather, conscience usually only forbids. And it is reasonable to forbid evil, because it is always possible not to act. If one is unsure whether an action is allowed, well, then one should first clear up that uncertainty and not risk doing something that might be wrong. Therefore, it is okay to pass laws to outlaw things, and also in a moral dilemma, it is al always okay for the individual to take the safer route and not act. However, if they're unsure whether something is good or evil, then they should first clear up the uncertainty first. So, I'll, I will let you read this. This is a discussion of morality, and the main thing is that for an act to be good, three things must be good. The end, up here in the rational layer, the action itself in the sensate la layer, the action itself is also called the moral object, and then lastly, the circumstances down in the you, physical layer. Now really, circumstances include rational and sensate things too, and goals could be physical, so it's not perfectly divided up that goals are only up here. Nevertheless, most of the time for human beings, the goals are up here in the rational layer. For someone like a child, the goal might be down here. For, for instance, a physical item to eat that is attractive to the child. Okay, so let us go through now the reappearance of these three levels throughout history. Because Aristotle and Plato were not the end of this, they were only the beginning. Language development. Um, linguistics has charted the development of language development, and we can see that unlike the common belief that language arose from the bottom up from cave drawings, contrary-wise, when we examine the most old, oldest languages in the world, hieroglyphics, be they Egyptian or Sumerian, we see that languages evolve from the top down. First comes thought, then comes speaking, or oral talk, and last comes writing. This is a demonstration that the human mind precedes the body in a metaphysical sense. It is also, therefore, a demonstration that the mind is from outside this world and that pure spirits do exist. Designating or naming are the term for the intellectual flow of ideas down into spoken terms and then into written terms, and then even down to physical objects, which they, those spoken or written terms are applied to as name tags. Conversely, the, the willful process in linguistics is signification, or another word is meaning. A written piece of writing codes for spoken sounds, and spoken sounds code for a complete idea. What about ideas? Well, there are three kinds of logic in Aristotle in his prior and posterior analytics, also in his categories. They are the logic of terms, which is only concerned with identifying terms or concepts and dividing them one from another, or uniting them if they overlap, kind of as you would see in Venn diagrams. Then the logic of propositions, which is concerned of predicating or proposing or saying that something is something else. The logic of proposition puts together two terms into a complete statement or proposition. And lastly, the logic of syllogisms, which it occurs only up at the rational level, which puts together two propositions to make what's called a complete syllogism. A is B, B is C, therefore A is C. These three sorts of logic correspond to the three levels that their terms exist at. Another example of the three levels is the classic kinds of education. This is, goes back to Plato and Aristotle and classical schools, then the medieval skills schools under Alcuin, and finally the renewal of classical education under Dorothy Sayers. 
young children up to about age 10 are usually taught grammar. Um, grammar is mostly where you're mastering the logic of terms. Logic is where you're mastering the logic of propositions, things like math. Um, and although math does include the top level too. And then the last highest level, level of the trivium is rhetoric, where you learn to construct complete arguments. Modern educational clinical psychology has also, surprise, surprise, rediscovered these three, three levels. Jean Piaget took tons and tons of data on watching young children develop and identified on his own three le levels of child growth, which he called the pre-operational, where children deal with signs and symbols, the concrete operational, where children kind of learn to master logic, and the formal operational, in entering into the high school years when children, or now young adults, start to master abstraction. This abstraction is not typically mastered until around age 26, when the brain completes its develop development. Um, over here, Lawrence Kohlberg, I, there is no public domain picture of him, so you can look up his picture on your own in Google Images, uh, identified six levels of child moral development in what we know is the physical layer. He said that children flee punishments and desire reward, positive rewards. At a higher level of moral development, they f flee looking bad and tend instead towards desiring to look good. And at an even higher level of moral development, young adults can fear to break their contract or their agreements, or at an even highest level, want to actually be a principal. So breaching, instead of agreements, I should have said breaking your principles, whereas at the highest level they want to be a principal and propagate their ideas out to others, being a source for others to drink from. Now that we have a complete understanding of human nature in these three levels, now we can start to understand the great mysteries of God that he has put into his scripture and the tradition of the church and in many other places throughout history. According to scholastic theology, there are three preternatural gifts. A man was gifted with original immortality. He would not die if he had not sinned. Adam was also given original integrity. That meant that his senses were, this whole level, were perfectly submissive and obedient towards to will. And lastly, his top rational level possessed original justice, which meant that it was in right relationship with God. However, with the fall, each one of these three preternatural, which means extra, each one of these extra gifts was taken away so that man was left with just his bare natural nature. The first thing man lost was his justice. By sinning, instead of right relationship with God, he entered into a state of sin. At his animal level then, therefore, instead of having integrity, his senses got quickly out of control so that they were expanding and often overpowering his higher rationality. This was, term is known as concupiscence, or the overpowering of the senses over what we know is right. And last of all, as a result of the excesses of the senses, all men do things they shouldn't and therefore experience death. Therefore, God said, Cursed is the ground because of you, and toil shall you eat of it all the days of your life. And henceforth man was cast out of the garden, and the effects of his sin were experienced not just in himself, but in the surrounding world. Other effects affected his body. Dysfunction and disease were the pathway to death. Shame and lust would lead to concupiscence, and the results of concupiscence would be bullying and pain. And the will would be weakened and the intellect darkened. So that is the main state of human beings now in their fallen nature. They have a darkened will, intellect, which means that they are not as logical as they could be. In fact, being logical takes much work, and one must think very focusedly and remove all sensate stimuli to do good logic. If you turn on a TV, 
your darkened intellect will have a hard time operating. And the will is weakened, which means that man does not obey his values as perfectly as he should. However, God was not going to leave man stuck in sin and death forever. Even from the beginning, he began sending to man revelation to help him to understand the condition of his state and how he could achieve some measure of salvation. He also gave man a certain measure of grace, although it was weak. In preparation for the coming of his son, who would redeem the whole human race, God sent, God sent forerunners, three offices. First, prophets would perform a work of justification for the people, preaching to them about what was the right way to live and what was sinful. Of course, this justification was weak, and it was largely ineffective in terms of saving the Hebrew people. God also established an office of priest. Under the Mosaic Law, the priest would perform the work of sanctification of the people, removing their sins insofar as that was capable under the weak rites of the old law. But this too was largely ineffective, and many of the Hebrews fell into the sins of their surrounding nations. Lastly, God established an office of king who would perform the work of glorification. Yet, however, this too was exceedingly weak in that it glorified only in the flesh, in the body, and not in the glorified body that we will have in eternity. We might ask ourselves why these three offices performed their roles so weakly. And the answer is that they did not have any direct connection to the Holy Trinity. In the minds of Christians, the Holy Trinity dwells in them. It's called the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but it's really an indwelling of all three persons of the Trinity. And they dwell in man's intellect and will that is in his interior mind. But the three offices of the Old Testament and the works they performed were instead in the three levels of man's exterior nature not in his interior mind. Therefore, there was no inner life between man and God. In fact, the only interaction between man and God would be once a year at the Day of Atonement, in which the high priest would take blood and into the Holy of Holies, where God actually dwelt, and make atonement briefly for the whole people before exiting. In order to purify his mind and the minds of his people permanently, he and the whole Hebrew people would have had to enter into that Holy of Holies and dwell there permanently, uh, rather than just him going in and out. For this reason, the three offices of the old law were not able to effectively justify, sanctify, and glorify man, but would only do a semblance of those saving actions upon the three levels of his outer nature. However, with the coming of Jesus Christ, all of this strife created in human nature would not be yet removed, that would wait until the resurrection of the just, but it would at least be counterbalanced to a significant degree that to the degree that we were in union with Jesus Christ, we could partially or even completely overcome these effects of fallen nature. Through divine revelation, the intellect is strengthened. Through grace, the will is strengthened. That divine revelation is, of course, scripture and the tradition of the church. It often gives both naturally knowable truths and not naturally knowable truths. So it also gives us beyond what our intellect is capable of, because we could never have known the not naturally knowable truths, such as that God is three persons in one nature. The result of the redemption was the water that flowed forth from the side of Christ, or from the side of the temple of his body. And it is the prophecy in Ezekiel said, wherever the river flows, it will bring life. That river of grace brings justification through the waters of baptism to the mind. Justification is the return of right relationship to God. At the sensate level, sanctification overcomes concupiscence 
and because when a person becomes holy, their senses again become submissive and obedient to the intellect and will. Shame and lust are exceedingly lessened, and bullying and pain are much restrained. Lastly, glorification is what occurs when the bodies of the saints are invested with supernatural qualities and power. It also refers to the visible glory or light that will shine from the bodies of the resurrected saints at the general resurrection. God has also given us certain many offices of the Holy Spirit to assist us with overcoming the effects of original sin. Healers overcome disease and miracle workers overcome dysfunction. Apostles become the willpower for establishing the church in new places and areas. Prophets bring the knowledge of truth to the church. Evangelists inspire her imagination. Pastors train the church's instinct to operate smoothly. Teachers demonstrate to our senses the truths of the faith. Helpers overcome bullying and troubles that we experience in life. Speakers of tongues translate formats of communication and administrators lay out the plans for the functioning of large portions of the church. What about the three saving actions of justification, sanctification, and glorification? Instead of the office of prophet, Christ appointed deacons to be ordained, to stand in the place of Christ the teacher, preaching the word of God to the people, thereby justifying them. Instead of the office of priest, Christ ordained that priests of a new covenant be consecrated to offer his own body and blood, the true sacrifice that takes away the sins of the world. And instead of the office of king, Christ commanded that bishops be ordained to rule over the people of God. Of course, drawing these three offices at these three levels is somewhat misleading, because while it is true that in the Old Testament these three officers ministered at these three levels, yet in the New Testament, the shadow or imitation is replaced by true life in God. So therefore, priests do not sanctify just the sensate level. So therefore, deacons do not preach just at the rational level, but also act sensately and physically in ceremonies. Similarly, priests do not just sanctify the sensate level, but also sanctify the body and the mind as well. Lastly, bishops do not rule just the physical level of the bodies of the people of God, but also rule in the realms of ideas and actions. This is because the shadow has been replaced by reality, and where before we served and were served within ourselves, in the three levels of our fleshly nature, now we do all this in the Spirit, serving and being served in the inner life of God, in whom our life is hidden. Consequently, we no longer arrange or view these three offices at the three levels, but now we view them as being mystically inside God, or at least from our earthly perspective, inside the three theological virtues which are our connection to God. In a certain sense, then, the pyramid, the three-level pyramid, has been turned upside down for us, so that now Christ the King, symbolized by the bishop, is now on top where God the Father, King of all things, is. Christ the prophet, symbolized by the deacon, is now below where God the Son, the Word, eternally proceeds from God the Father. And Christ the high priest, eternally offering himself through the eternal spirit, remains in the middle where the Holy Spirit exists as the mutual love between the Father and the Son. We can then chart the members of the Most Holy Trinity and the connections that we have to them. Jesus Christ is the Word, the Holy Spirit is love, and God the Father is the source of all things. Then there are the three theological virtues by which we have direct connections to these three persons of the Blessed Trinity. First, divine faith was first had by the patriarch Abraham, and it is had in God the Son, the Word. Next, the theological virtue of divine love was first received by the patriarch Jacob, and it occurs in God the Holy Spirit, the Sanctifier. Lastly, the theological virtue of divine hope was first received by the patriarch Isaac, and it occurs in God the Father, whom we hope in. 
the work of justification, then, is performed by God the Son, justifying us through knowing us as members of his body, especially through the action and ministry of all those who have been ordained deacons and preached to us. Next, God the Holy Spirit sanctifies us by dwelling in our hearts as in a temple and bestowing his graces upon us, especially through the work of those who have been ordained priests in the church. Lastly, God the Father will someday glorify us, making the radiance of our resurrected body reflect his to the degree that we have merited it, especially through the work of obedience to those who rule as bishops in the church. We might note for comparison, then, that the Old Testament offices of prophet, priest, and king would correspond in this way, but however, these three offices did not actually exist in the inner life of the Most Holy Trinity. Therefore, they were only foreshadowing in the flesh the true life that would go on in God. However, in the fullness of time, after everything had been prepared, Jesus Christ himself came as the teacher, the fulfillment of all the preceding prophets, as the high priest, offering himself as both priest and victim, the perfect and acceptable sacrifice to God the Father to take away sin and to give grace. And as Christ the King, both King of the Jews and after his ascension to heaven, as King over all the kings and nations of the world, the work of justification, sanctification, and glorification is then now more effectively and more truly performed through the church in the offices which he established as a memorial of his own saving action on earth. First, he established the office of deacon, who is ordained to stand in the place of Christ the teacher, preaching the word of God to the people and thereby justifying them. Then he established the office of priest, who is ordained to stand in the place of Christ the high priest, offering the now unbloody sacrifice of Christ's own body and blood through the Holy Spirit to God the Father, and administering its resultant merits and graces back down to the people, thereby, thereby sanctifying, sanctifying them. them. And lastly, Christ the King glorifies his people through the office of bishop, who is ordained to sit in the place of Christ the King, ruling over the people of God, enforcing Christ's own will upon them, and thus presiding over the dispensation of God the Father to them, thereby preparing an eternal glory for them at the resurrection when all things will be revealed. However, these three offices of deacon, priest, and bishop are not just symbols of Christ in his role when he lived on earth. Rather, they are sacraments of Christ's own presence, which means, of course, that they do not merely symbolize Christ in these three offices, but that in a mystical way they actually are Christ in that role which they perform. Now, symbolically, they are something even higher than this. Symbolically, they actually symbolize the three roles of each of the three per persons of the Blessed Trinity in whose life we will someday share. The deacon symbolizing the eternal word, the priest symbolizing the Holy Spirit's ecstatic love and blessings, and the bishop symbolizing God the Father. It is then an exceedingly great grace and gift that our life through the ordained ministry is not just historical to relive Christ as he was on earth, nor just present to live Christ as he exists now in the heavens, but it is also future to mystically engage in the inner life of the Trinity, now, as it were, in a glass darkly, though no less really, but someday visibly in the kingdom of God. There are also seven human commandments. When violated, these destroy the basis for existence of one, two, or all three levels of human nature, so that that part of you is not worthy and cannot enter the kingdom of God, and by means of it all of you will be thrown into hell. These commandments are given in Deuteronomy 5, chapter 5, and there are ten of them because three concern the three persons of the Blessed Trinity, 
The first one corresponds to God, to our life in God the Father. The second one corresponds to our life in God the Son. And the third one corresponds to our life in God the Holy Spirit. Then the last seven concern love of neighbor. So th these seven will fulfill all the mathematical possibilities by which you can select one, two, or all three levels of human nature. For instance, three commandments will concern just each of the three layers. Three other commandments will concern two of the layers, leaving out the, th the last layer. And one com commandment will concern all three la la layers. Three plus three plus one equals seven. Honor your father and your mother. If we break that, we make our physical level unworthy to enter heaven, which is our body. You shall not kill. Now, death is the separation of spirit and body by the destruction of the middle layer, the senses. So if we kill, then we break that connection of our rationality to the physical world. Sixth, do not commit adultery. Adultery is a sent both an animal and a bodily action. So marital relations with someone not your spouse will make both of these levels of you unholy. You shall not steal. Stealing is making a rational decision to perform a brazen action to take some object of someone else's that they have a right to and that belongs to them. Doing an act of theft makes all parts of you unworthy of entering coming into the presence of God. You shall not bear false witness. That lying is speech at the sensing level contrary to thought at the rational layer. If you lie, you make these two top layers unworthy to enter heaven. You shall not covet. Covetousness is willed sensual animal attraction or sentimental animal attraction, but usually sensual. And you shall not covet others' goods is wanting another's abstract situation so much as to drive out the Holy Spirit by being unthankful for your for the rest of your your existence. Here we see that these commandments satisfy all the po mathematical possibilities for how to select one, two, or all three levels of human nature. There they are again. The seven deadly sins do the same thing. The seven deadly sins are traditionally known as infinite piles of tinder, or fomes peccati. When we set those fires, piles of tinder on fire and let them burn and do not quickly put it out, they will burn hotter and hotter with more and more fuel until they completely destroy us. The seven deadly sins are more, as it were, at the very center of each of, our, of, each of the layers of our nature, not at the periphery. The, set, the set Ten Commandments were at the periphery in the sense that they are the border, the bare minimum border, which we must remain inside of to be in the presence of God or in God's kingdom or in a state of grace destined for heaven. Conversely, so if we trespass the border of one of these commandments, we have left God, fallen out of God. However, the seven deadly sins are at this very centers of our natures. So they are like a huge whirlpool sucking us in. Consequently, the seven deadly sins can become addictions. They combine the three they combine the three sources of evil at each of the three respective layers, the lust of the flesh at the bottom, the lust of the eyes in the middle, and the pride of life at the top. The lust of the flesh is counteracted by fasting. Therefore, fasting is an antidote to those deadly sins down at that physical level. The lust of the eyes is counteracted by closing your eyes and praying. So prayer counteracts those deadly sins. Long prayer, serious prayer, counteracts those deadly sins at the sensate level. And almsgiving, or giving away money or other goods to the poor reduces your cocky pride of life and so that takes away reduces and is an antidote and works against the sins the deadly sins at the rational level 
So, the original deadly sin of Satan was pride. Excessive self-love. Envy is excessive desire to be of another, to be living another's life or situation or existence. Gluttony is excessive love of food or drink or other bodily activity. Anger is excessive out-of-control animal rage, which is whenever you have a really powerful idea that is so strong that it can you cannot stop expressing it out here in the sensate level. Lust is when you have a really powerful imagination that cannot stop looking at something in the physical level. Sloth is when you have a really non-powerful sensate level so that the part so that your soul separates into just thoughts and sitting. Sloth is metaphysically equivalent to living death. You're not doing anything. Lack of life. And lastly, greed is when you just want to have it all in at all three levels. It, rationally with the ideas, sensate with the experiences, and physical with all the goods and possessions. Again, these satisfy all of the mathematical possibilities. And notice how each one of them corresponds in a certain way to a similar one of the Ten Commandments. For instance, lust and adultery are very similar, both having to do with venereal activity. And there they are again. The Seven Sacraments mystically, sanctif mystically sanctify one, two, or all three levels of human nature and the relations between them by sharing in the mystical body of Christ. These are ways that we participate in Christ through sacred sim ceremonies that not just symbolize, but actually make real what they, what they symbolize. Baptism sanctifies the physical body, making it destined for heaven. It, therefore, it can be performed even on non-conscious non or non-subconscious babies who have just been born because it sanctifies the body. Fundamentally, it is a death with Christ in the waters of baptism, as Romans 6 says. It's a, and that is a death to sin, so that one may come out of the waters to a new spiritual life of sanctity. Confirmation sanctifies the sensate level, completing baptism and making the actions at the sensate level have supernatural meritorious value. Ordination sanctifies the rational layer, giving the ordained person the mind of Christ. Marriage sanctifies the connection between the, the sensate and physical layers. It creates a life that goes on there, and not just a normal life, but a spiritual one. That's the power of the sacrament in the normal, the normal the normal natural institution of marriage. Confession is a sacramental act by which we speak against ourselves, accusing ourselves in the presence of Jesus, who is in the person of the priest, thereby coming again to be known by Jesus, and thus coming back into right relationship with him, so that he can then again intercede for us before the throne of God. Extreme unction prepares a person for death, strengthening the mind to battle hard in itself in preparation for the final struggle, or in some cases, extreme unction has frequently been known to actually heal the illness, presumably in the event that for whatever reason God does not wish the person to die at that time, perhaps because they are not actually ready to die. And the sacrament of the Eucharist sanctifies all three levels of human nature, being the fullness, the source, and summit of all of our sacramental life in the Church. Again, we see that they satisfy all the seven mathematical possibilities, and notice again how the sacraments correspond to the deadly sins and the commandments. There they are again. Lastly, the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit do the same thing. The seven gifts come from Isaiah 11, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, 
the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. And his delight, spiritual delight, will be in the fear of the Lord. Seven gifts of the Holy Spirit are graces that are strengthened through the sacrament of confirmation, but also in many other ways. And they take the normal human faculties and elevate them so that they act in supernatural ways. Fortitude strengthens the physical nature, preparing one to go through the battle of even death. Knowledge strengthens the rationality, illumining the intellect again. Counsel strengthens the connection between our intellect and our rationality, advising us what to do. Piety strengthens our sensate level, teaching us to delight in what is holy. Divine fear teaches us to fear bodily acts, especially venereal ones. Wisdom is knowledge of how the highest principles manifest themselves in even the lowest outcomes. Understanding is knowing all the steps in between the causes and their effects. Again, we see that each of these fulfill all the mathematical possibilities. Notice also the connections of the gifts of the Holy Spirit to the sacraments, the deadly sins, and the commandments. In particular, the gifts of the whole, each gift of the Holy Spirit stops the corresponding deadly sin. And each commandment under the old law manifests, manifests itself into a sacrament that Christ has commanded. And there they are again. The three levels of human nature also find expression in the eschat eschatology of the book of Revelation. They will apply to the, just as the days of creation occurred in the book of Genesis, these will apply to the beasts and blessed, blesseds, to the set each of the seven churches, to each of the seven trumpets, and to the seven bowls of wrath. At the very beginning of the Bible, in the first chapter of Genesis, God begins by laying out the plan for all of history and all of the world and the church based upon the modeling of human nature. In the first three days, God provides form to his creation. In the next three days, he fills in the voids or emptinesses in each of those forms with things that symbolize aspects of human nature at that particular level. In the fourth day, rational concepts are symbolized. The sun symbolizing Jesus Christ in eternity, and the moon symbolizing his blessed mother. The stars symbolizing angels and saints. In the fifth day, God creates the seething waters symbolizing the sensate level, together with the birds and the sea creatures symbolizing the institutions of the Gentiles. In the sixth day, God creates Adam and Eve, symbolizing the new Adam and the new Eve, and he also creates the creeping and crawling creatures, symbolizing the institutions of the Semites and other religions that are based in the flesh. He also creates the garden, representing the garden of our virtues, with the plants and the fruits, symbolizing the various good works we do, and also protections given for our well-being, and the animals symbolizing institutions such as nations and corporations and things like that. Lastly, there's the tree of life in the garden, undoubtedly symbolizing the cross. We might also point out that by arranging the six days in two columns like this, we remove the principal evolutionary objection to this having a literal sense, namely that plants could be made before the sun. We therefore see that this six-day schema in Genesis lays the symbolic context for the entire Bible, not just in a historical and literal sense, but also in a human or moral sense, as well as in even Christological and eschatological senses. The book of Revelation, however, has the greatest number of 
mysteries, making use of all three layers and all their seven mathematical possibilities. In the first through third chapters of the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ, now ascended into heaven, gives a message to his church for all time. And it is not just to any specific seven churches in Turkey or Asia Minor, as it might seem from the style of the address. But this, these are seven churches representing all the different ways that churches could possibly exist at any time or place within his body, the mystical body of Jesus Christ. The first church that Christ speaks to is that of Ephesus, that has all the completeness, all the gifts and strengths of all the other churches in itself. This is symbolized by the seven candle lampstand, and Christ tells it that although they have everything, they must not forget to hold fast to their first love. If they do return to their first love, then he promises them to eat of the tree of life. The second church is the church of Smyrna, which is the church which Christ gives every assistance he can to and lays no burden on it, but he tells them that many of them will soon be killed. If they conquer death, then he promises them a crown of life and that they will not experience the second death, which is the death of hell. To the third church, the church of Pergamum, which dwells where Satan's throne is, which is the place where there is much talk and worldly wisdom, Christ comes representing himself as a sharp two-edged sword which cuts both ways. He tells them that if they are faithful and keep his name and do not deny it, that he will give them some of the hidden manna, as well as when they reach heaven, a hidden stone with a hidden name that only they and he know. To the church of Thyatira that dwells in the midst of earthly fornicators and harlots, and the seedy side of life. Christ tells them not to commit fornication with Jezebel, the fake prophetess who seduces members of the community, but tells them instead that if they hold fast to his teaching and keep themselves from her sin, that they shall receive the morning star of unconcerned purity from sexual desire, and as well as they shall rule the nations with a rod of iron. To the church of Sardis, which has the name of being alive, but which is actually dead, Christ tells them to clean their garments, which have been soiled with sin, and to instead put on new garments washed in the blood of the Lamb, and that if they do so, he will not blot out their name from the book of life. To the church of Philadelphia, which kept God's word, but had no power, but nevertheless believed, Christ tells them that he will protect them from the coming tribulations that will come upon the world. And he also tells them that they will be like a pillar in his temple in heaven. That he will write upon them his own name, the name of his father, and the name of the new city of Jerusalem. And that they will never go out of his temple forever and ever. And to the church of Laodicea, which is lukewarm, and thinks that it has everything, but like a poor, naked baby, has nothing. Christ alerts them to their urgent status and tells them to buy from him gold and clothing and the things necessary to be blessed in eternal life, and tells them that if any of them do it, that he will grant them to sit down upon his throne as he has sat upon his father's throne. These churches, again, satisfy all the possibilities for the three levels of human nature. We see that the churches which concern death and life are in simply the middle layer, either in it or surrounding it. The church, that one church deals with speech, another church with venereal issues. The three churches deal with just one aspect of Christian life, and one church deals with all the aspects. In the middle chapters of the book of Revelation, the Apostle John, who is writing the book, is given a spirit of prophecy and images of the future ages of the world. These ages are represented by the seven trumpets. Later they will be completed by seven bowls of wrath, which are very similar to them and which complete God's wrath. 
but these trumpets are not complete but only partial chastisements or punishments on the world, each of them destroying one-third of the realm in which they occur. In my opinion, these occur every 700 years. The first trumpet is a rain of hail, blood, and fire, which desertifies one-third of the earth. In my opinion, this is the Islamic conquest. In the second trumpet, a mountain burning with fire is thrown into the ocean, and a third of the ships are sunk. In my opinion, this is the age of exploration. The third trumpet is that a burning star falls from heaven upon the waters and the rivers of water, which flow from the er area of the earth to the area of the sea. And a third of these waters are polluted with wormwood, which in Ukrainian is pronounced Chernobyl. The fourth trumpet, a third of the lights in the night sky are darkened. The fifth trumpet, a star falls from heaven and opens the key to the bottomless pit, releasing locusts, which torment men for several months, but does not kill them. In fact, death flies from them, so that they cannot die, even though they seek it desperately. The sixth trumpet, the, the great river Euphrates, is dried up, preparing the way for a hundred million cavalry to come and punish the earth. The seventh trumpet, loud voices are heard in heaven, and the kingdom of the world becomes the kingdom of God. At the end of time, these trumpets are recapitulated, which means done again in a similar way, by seven bulls of wrath. Unlike the trumpets, however, these bulls of wrath destroy everything. The first bull of wrath shall bring foul and evil sores of disease upon the inhabitants of the earth. The second shall turn the sea to blood and cause everything in it to die. The third shall cause the rivers and fountains of water to be turned into blood because the people of earth killed so many martyrs and witnesses to Christ. The fourth shall cause the sun to scorch the earth so that men curse God from the searing heat. The fifth shall cause the throne of the beast to be destroyed, so that his kingdom shall be plunged into darkness. The sixth shall cause the river Euphrates to be dried up in preparation for the kings of the east to gather their army for the battle of Armageddon to war against God and his angels. And the seventh shall be a plague of hail that will cause the cities of the earth to fall, split the city of Jerusalem into three parts, also causing the islands to flee away, while the people of the earth, small and great, flee from the blazing wrath of the Lamb on his throne. We see, then, that the bulls of wrath recapitulate the trumpets. Um, two of them deal with the sea, two of them with rivers, two of them with the night sky or the outer space, two of them deal with the riders who come and punish or fight. Two of them deal with the great river Euphrates being dried up, and two complete the plague with either hail or voices of judgment. Beyond this, there are the three final things, the three beasts and the three saving entities. The three beasts each operate by one principle that empowers their being. These principles, again from the part on de the deadly sins, are the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The lust of the flesh empowers the beast from the earth. The lust of the eyes empower the beast of the sea with the harlot of Babylon riding upon it. And the pride of life, of course, it empowers the devil who said, I sh will not serve. Against the beast from the earth, the principle of fasting empowers the true lamb, once slain, who spent 40 days in the desert. Against the lust of the eyes, the principle of prayer empowers the bride, the new Jerusalem, who waits for the coming of the Lord. And against the power of the pride of life, the generosity of almsgiving empowers the word of God, who stooped to take upon himself our lowly nature so that he might save us from our sins. The 
Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who is thirsty come. Let him who desires take the water of life without price. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints. Amen.